That's huge. <laughs> love it. But you know what I love even more? I can only see three or four people of you having the smartphone in their hand. I know you don't have an internet connection here, but I assume you just put it away because you're so excited about the third session, so thank you for that. And let's use that moment. Please, guys, close your eyes, all of you. Don't cheat. And now smile. If you don't know what that is, please open your mouth and show me your teeth. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> open your eyes again. When was the last time you did that without your smartphone in your hand? Can you remember? Or can you remember the last time you actually turned off your phone at night? Because when I was in eighth grade of high school, I remember that a friend of mine was telling me that she's not turning off her phone at night. And that was shocking to me. It was so shocking that I even told my mother about it. Like, hey mom, can you imagine? There is a friend of mine, she's not turning off her phone at night. Can you imagine the whole night? Because back in times, people worried that the radiates of the smartphone could affect your brain if you sleep right next to it. And you're laughing now in 2019, but me being eighth grade wasn't a long time ago. I've recently been guest 17 years old, so it must have been last year, right? <laughs> so again, what also happened in eighth grade, when I was in eighth grade, which as you know, feels like last year, my girlfriend, that didn't exist, would probably have not allowed me to say good morning to any other girl if we would have woken up together. And now in 2019, it's totally fine to say, good morning, Alexa, before you say anything else, right? Although technology is designed for us, vice versa changes us. Now, Kurzweil wrote in 2011 that our overall rate of progress is doubling every decade. He said, we're not going to have 100 years of progress in the 21st century. It'll be more like 20,000 years of progress that we'll see in the 21st century. So it seems like there's a technology being created and then it grows exponentially, day by day, week by week, month by month, and year by year, right? Actually, it's not. Because we humans don't care about technology. You don't care and I don't care. The only thing we care about is what the technology can do for us. <coughs> and in order to illustrate that and to ask ourselves the question, when do we actually adopt a new technology? When do we change our behavior? When do we adopt new habits, new feelings, and new behavior? Let's look at tokenization and security tokens, because this is one technology where I believe that the value is massive. It's so massive that people will actually change and adopt their behavior. In order to do that, let me introduce you to Lisa. So Lisa is a very caring mother. She has two children, and she's so lovely that she wants to save some money for her children that they should be given when they turn 18 years old. So when they want to pursue a university career, they can, for example, use that money to pay for a university degree. Now, what Lisa also knows is that putting the money on her bank account leads to inflation coming up, which means her money is getting worth less every single day, right? And that's a pity because she knows that the money she puts in now on the bank account is only worth a fraction of what it is worth now when the children turn 18 years old. So what can Lisa do about that? Well, since Lisa is an architect, she knows quite something about real estate and she believes that Putting this money into properties like houses or flats could save her money from inflation. Now, the problem is that Lisa has saved 10,000 US dollars. And these 10,000 US dollars are not enough to buy a flat or even a house. They're not even enough to go to the bank and get a sufficient loan to finance her investment, right? So, most probably, Lisa has to watch her money passing by every single day then. The money she has saved over five years of waking up, going to work, and putting the money down for her children to have a better future is now getting worth less every single day. And that's really bad. So what can Lisa do? And you might ask yourself, what does that have to do with innovation or technology? But I'm going to tell you there is a technology which can solve exactly these issues. And what we do here is technologically called tokenization. So instead of having one person who's buying one house for $200,000, we now have 1,000 people paying $200 each and sharing this house. So with that technology, you can buy a fraction of almost anything. Whether it's a house, a car, art, you can, for example, buy a piece of art from Da Vinci and just own 0.1% of it. You don't have to buy the whole one. Now, this gives the power back 
to the majority of people because now this asset class, especially of art, has been preserved for very wealthy and rich individuals. And with tokenization, with fractional ownership, we can give that power back and the accessibility back to people who have an average income and who want to save their money from getting burned by the inflation, who want to stay independent from the financial system and who want to decide about their own financial future. And that's amazing, right? Because now people like Lisa, the first time in history, have the chance to actually invest their small amounts of money into something that saves her from inflation. Now, the even better thing is that they cannot only invest it, they can also sell it at any given time. So now, let's suppose Lisa's children actually turn 18 years old and they're now going to university, and they have to pay for the university degree. They can now sell this 2% of a house, 3% of a house, at any given time and go to university from that money. Now, getting back to the question of when we humans change and when we adopt new technology, that probably sounds really clear to you, right? There's a good technology, so people are adopting it. There's a bad technology, people won't probably adopt it, and this technology is going away. Seems pretty easy, and there's nothing that I need to tell you about. But let's look at a different example. Let's put the tokens away, and now look at something completely different. Please raise your hands. Who have you invested in Bitcoin? One, two, three, four, some of you. <laughs> well, the interesting question is, when are we actually getting to the point where we can use cryptocurrencies for our everyday life, where we can go to the store, we can go to the shoe store, we can go to the restaurant, to the bakery, and we can purchase our everyday goods with cryptocurrencies. Now, I'm a big believer in cryptocurrencies, and I'm waiting for this moment for more than six years. And even after 10 years of its existence, since Bitcoin has been invented, that never happened in Europe. You can't go to the store and ask them to pay with Bitcoin. Please try tomorrow, but it won't work. Trust me. <laughs> and why is that? Because cryptocurrencies have a huge value they're providing. They make you independent from governments. They make you independent from financial systems because this currency is not regulated by one financial authority. It's created by a majority of people and it gives the power back to the individual. Now still, people didn't accept it even after 10 years. So apparently I had to start asking myself, why the hell are people not using cryptocurrencies? Are they too lazy? Don't they understand it? Or are they just ignorant? And I have to admit, it's none of the above. It's simply because there was no need or no reason to use cryptocurrencies. Because in Europe, you can pay with a lot of different payment options almost everywhere. You can, pay with, you can pay with credit cards, you can pay with mobile payments, you can pay with cash. All the things that people are used to for hundreds or thousands of years, we're talking about cash. So why the hell should people start using cryptocurrencies? I mean, there is a huge benefit of using cryptocurrencies, but the effort to learn how cryptocurrencies work and actually starting to use them is much higher than the effort. So people didn't actually start to use cryptocurrencies for their everyday life. <coughs> now, you might now think, okay, security tokens, security token offerings, amazing. <coughs> cryptocurrencies, we don't need that. But that's, again, only half of the proof. Because what I want to speak about today is not smartphones, it's not security tokens, and it's not Bitcoin. It's the question how human minds and technology interact with each other. Because look at the example of Europe, where cryptocurrencies still haven't evolved as a valid payment method. And now take the same technology, but a different group of people. Let's look at Venezuela. What happened in Venezuela was, during the crisis, there was a huge hyperinflation. And during that hyperinflation, people started to use cryptocurrencies for their everyday payments. Why? Because they simply had two options. Option one would be, you can hold your money and risk that it's only half of it tomorrow. Or option two would be, you go and buy Bitcoin and you stay independent from your government or from your financial system. So people actually voted for the second option and many of them bought cryptocurrencies and accepted cryptocurrencies. So in Venezuela, you can actually go to a shoe shop, literally. You can go to a restaurant, literally. You can literally go to a bakery and pay your bread with Bitcoin. Because the need was there and people simply wanted to use it, and there was a huge benefit provided by that. So there's one thing you should take away from today's speech. It is that 
there always must be a value provided with technology. And technology is never a self-fulfilling prophecy because we humans don't care. We care about how technology can make our lives better and how it can change our life for good. We don't care about which features the technology have or how sophisticated it is. We only care about how can it make my day better. And we as consumers, we need to think of technology as a chance, not as a risk. Because trying a new type of technology often is like trying a new type of chocolate that you've never tried, right? Seems like a huge risk at the beginning, <laughs> buying this new type of chocolate. But once you ate it and you liked it, <laughs> you're going to recommend it to your friends and guess what, they're going to buy it too. And believe me, the same works for technology. So technology must make our life better and technology must be made for humans, not vice versa. So technology must make our life better the same way I hope that this evening of amazing TEDx speeches with amazing speakers and amazing organizers made your evening better. And I thank you very much and I hope you're embracing technology, you're open to it, and I hope to see you all after this speech. Thank you very much.